Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, guys. I hope you've been enjoying the study for the Luke, uh, book of Luke. One thing that I don't understand with other preachers, I'm not saying I'm the best preacher or anything like that, right? But obviously, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches preach through the Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I was telling some of the men, I don't know how you preach through the Gospels without preaching on soul winning. I mean, soul winning is on every chapter. <laughs> how do you get away from being a preacher? How, 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 how are you a preacher that doesn't preach, you know, on soul winning? Even if I wanted to avoid it, I couldn't. <laughs> you know, I couldn't avoid it. There's so many scriptures. And as we were uh, listening to the reading from Luke chapter 10, we were seeing that all over again. But look at verse number 16. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. And I think this is a good reminder for us as soul winners in verse number 16. It says, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. So the title of the sermon this morning is, He that heareth you, heareth me. All right, He that heareth you, heareth me. Let's start off with verse number 1. And remember, uh, chapter 9. Jesus had sent his 12 apostles, you know, to go into every city and he gave them power to heal. He gave them power over uh, uh, casting out devils. And we see the same thing play out all over again here in verse number one. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city um, and place whither he himself would come. So we saw there in Luke 9 that he sent out the 12. And now he's sending another 70. Praise God! Right? Praise God that the Lord had added uh, laborers into the harvest. Right? What, what the 12 could achieve was fantastic. They came back rejoicing. Now Jesus says, you know what? We're going to increase that by another 70. So now we have, you know, with the, 12, with the 12 apostles, now we have really 82. 82 being given this power. They go into every place, to every city. Look at verse number 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Hey, this is what he's telling the 70 that he's sending out. All right. So he says, look, at the 70, you know, you need to be praying for more laborers as well. All right. And uh, keep your finger there. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Because I want to show you this where Jesus said very similar words, okay, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. I just want to show you and compare this. Uh, it says, uh, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Do you see that uh, chapter 9, the end of chapter 9, the beginning of chapter 10, is what we read in the previous chapter, Luke chapter 9. So when Jesus sends out his twelve, he says, hey, you're going to go out there and be a laborer in the harvest, I want you also to be praying for more laborers. So then we get later on, the prayers are answered. We get another 70 going out. And Jesus says to the 70, pray for the same thing. I'm going to give you power over the devils and heal the sick in the same way that the 12 were given. And he says to the 70, hey, you pray for more laborers. All right. But I want you to notice there that the expectation is that you're a laborer yourself. You know, that you're a laborer yourself, and, and that's just Jesus' expectation. And he says, because you're a laborer, pray for more laborers. And we see the prayer answered. Another 70 going out, okay? So uh, we see that, you know, truly Christ wants laborers. He wants laborers into his harvest. You know, and uh, go back to Luke chapter 10. Go back to Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you that Jesus gave those instructions to his disciples, and now he's given the same lesson, the same teaching, to the 70 that are going out. And uh, look at verse number 3. It says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Hey, when we go out and we preach the gospel, we should be going as lambs. Okay, You're not the wolf. You're not the one that's trying to devour the person at the door. The lamb is gentle. All right, The lamb is pleasant. That's how you ought to be when you knock on your neighbor's door. Okay, don't be rude, you know, don't be hostile. 
but like a wolf, be like the lamb being sent forth as lambs among wolves. And if you notice in verse number one, Jesus sends them out two and two. Okay, two by two the way we will do it. The reason we do it two by two today, and look, if you've got no partner, there's nothing wrong with you going by yourself and knocking doors, but the ideal scenario is that you would have a partner with you. Why is that? Because you're like a lamb amongst wolves, all right? Having that person with you, that silent partner, is a huge help, okay? First of all, that person should be praying at the door, you know, um, maybe they can help you, you know, if you get stuck on something, they can help you out. But also, you know, if you get injured, if you're out there, you know, and someone harms you or you just get injured, you know, there's someone there that can call for help. There's someone there that can lift you up and help you out. But also, you know, if there's a false accusation, you know, you go to someone's door and, and they, they claim that you've done something wrong, you've, you've, you know, you've done some evil, that you've got that second witness there with you that can say, no, you know, I was a witness, I saw what happened and this is what took place. So going two by two is biblical, but it also gives us protection as lambs among wolves. Verse number four, and the same instructions that he gave his, his 12, he says, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And does, look, when it says salute no man by the way, it's not like, like ignore people that you come across. It's basically don't be distracted by the work you're doing. I'm sending you to these cities. Your goal is to preach the gospel. I don't want you getting sidetracked with conversations, okay? And again, good things that we ought to apply as soul winners, right? We go to the door. Sometimes people say to you, look, I don't have, I don't have time. You know, do you have time for me to give you the God? No, I haven't got time. But many times they want to tell you their life story. Many times they want to have a conversation about anything besides the Bible. And you might get trapped into thinking, you know what? Maybe if I just let them talk for a while, they'll give me the chance later on. And I've done that. You know, I've done that. Oh, they want to talk. All right, I'll let them talk a bit. And it's like, well, you know, now that you, because you do have the time, you know, can I show you the, but nah, I'm not interested. I don't have time. All right, so look, you know, as soul winners, we should be careful not to be distracted when we have a goal, when we have a mission to do. All right. Verse number five. Into, and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. So you bring in a blessing. If someone accepts you into the house, and we'll see his, his, uh, soon here that it's, actual, it's an actual believer, okay, that accepts you into the house, you know, bless the house, bless the people there. Verse number six, it says that, and if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Now that, that phrase, son of peace, it's not found anywhere else in the Bible. So if you're, I was kind of wondering, what is, it, who, what is the son of peace? Uh, so we don't have anything that we can reference, but I think it's, it should be pretty straightforward, I think. Because Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace, right? In Isaiah 9, 6, the Prince of Peace. And when someone receives the, or the gospel, what's the gospel also called? It's also God, and the kids, you guys uh, memorize this, you know, the armor, the armor, of, the, the, the armor of God, when you, sh, uh, when you put your shoes on, what was it called? Do you guys remember? It was the, what, what, what are you preparing yourself for? You're preparing yourself for the gospel of peace. Remember that? The gospel of peace. So what I believe the son of peace is here is someone that has the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone that has received the gospel of peace and has the prince of peace basically uh, in them. Okay? So I believe he's saying here that if you go into someone's house, they're a believer, you know, bless them. But if they're not a believer, then turn away from them. Don't go, don't go into an unbeliever's house, I think is what essentially what it's being taught here. Verse number seven, and in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. So if someone receives you, you know, a believer especially, and they, they, give you, they offer you a drink, they offer you a bit of food or whatever, so you can be comfortable on your journey, Jesus says, look, accept it, you know, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, you know. You know, someone that's, that's uh, preaching the gospel, someone that's working for the Lord, they're worthy to be, to be uh, paid. They're worthy to be rewarded, you know. And uh, keep your finger there and turn to 1 Timothy. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Because this, uh, this is a, 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 a teaching from the Old Testament, okay, but we see two applications here. We see it to, of someone that's out there preaching the gospel, all right? But we also see this as an application to pastors. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Let the elders, 
that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. So those that labour in doctrine, those that study it, those that preach the word of God, feed you the word of God, they're worthy of double honour. And look at verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. All right, so, you know, there are people that believe, you know, full-time workers, you know, that, that serve the church or maybe act as, you know, like an evangelist or a missionary. You know, these people shouldn't be paid. I mean, there's a movement that, that basically doesn't want pastors to be paid. And they believe if a pastor gets paid, you know, they're a hireling. There's someone that's just working for money, you know. But we see in the Bible, it's very scriptural that if you're going to labor in word and doctrine, that you're worthy of your hire. You know, you're worthy of your reward. You, you're, you know, it's some, someone that ought to be paid, all right? So I'm not saying that because I don't get paid here. <laughs> I'm not saying that. It's just what we're up to in the scriptures, you know? But I, I would love, and I'll just give you a quick testimony, and I've, I've shared this with a few of you, but last Sunday was the first time that I've been completely reimbursed. Like, since we started the church, obviously I put some, you know, uh, you know some of my personal finances forward, you say, what, 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 what is it, you know? Well, I mean, there's, a, there's actually a lot that, that goes to organizing a church and having the resources that you need and all those kinds of things. And obviously, as a new church, we just didn't have the finances. So I put forth a lot of, you know, things out of my own pocket. When we got this building, again, I, you know, I took it out of my own pocket. And I was kind of expecting, you know, I probably won't get that money back for a while, you know? And I wasn't too bothered about it. It's not like I'm desperate for it or anything like that. But, you know, this past Sunday was fantastic. Praise God, we had enough. We had an amazing amount that came in through November. Again, a surprise because we're approaching Christmas. And normally in Christmas, you know, people are, you know, concerned about money for holidays or concerned about money for Christmas, you know, you know, buying presents and all those kinds of things. So, I, I'm, you know, as the pastor, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, of the, you know, the offerings, the tithes and offerings that are coming into this church. Honestly, it's, it's fantastic, completely reimbursed. That's, that's something that's off my mind right now. And, you know, maybe in the new year, maybe looking forward, I can, I can revisit and see, hey, whether, you know, this laborer is worthy of some hire, worthy of some reward. We'll see. We'll see in the new year, okay? But let's move on. Go back to Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that last, uh, ver uh, last sentence there. He says, go not from house to house. So the instruction to these 70, if someone lets you into their house, just you know, be there, they're going to provide for you, they're going to feed you, etc. They're going to give you what you need. But don't go from house to house. You know, establish yourself and then from that location, go and preach the gospel into that city. Okay? Don't waste your time going from one house to another house. This is not going house to house preaching the gospel. This is, you know, what he's saying is don't go house to house seeking for, um, you know, sustenance, seeking for what you need to be able to do your job. No, stay in the house that you're at and then go and preach the gospel. And I thought, I thought this was interesting because it reminds me of a waste of time that a lot of my Baptist brethren do, you know? And I know they're not, you know, they don't mean, they, it's not like they mean evil. It's, they mean well. They're just trying to serve the Lord. They have a heart to serve the Lord, right? But they've been taught that before you can become a pastor, they've been taught before you can become a missionary, you've got to essentially go house to house. What do I mean by that? Well, the church is the house of the Lord. And essentially, they'll spend years, you know, two years, three years, going from church to church, you know, seeking financial um, help so they can go in and, and work for the Lord. But you know what? Preaching the gospel doesn't cost you anything except maybe 15 minutes of your time, all right? That's all it costs. I mean, knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, hey, I'm from the local church. I'm here to give the gospel. Can I present it to you? That's not going to cost you anything. You don't need to go from house to house. From, from church to church to get, you know, what you need. Hey, you know what we should be teaching our young people? You know, if you have a desire to get into uh, the ministry one day, become a full-time worker, what we should be teaching them is go get a job. You know, go get a job, get married, have kids, live life, you know, preach the gospel, you know, every week in your church, serve in your church, and when the time is right and you're able to provide for yourself, then go out and serve the Lord, all right? You know, establish yourself in that one house and from that house serve the Lord. Don't waste time going everywhere, spending years and years when you should be just out there preaching the gospel. All right? And you say, oh, I have a desire to, 
to become a missionary in a foreign field. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But if you're not being a missionary here, you're never going to be a missionary in the foreign field. Okay? If you're not serving here, when you have, you know, a church that supports you, when you have a house that's over your head, and you're not doing that, you're never going to be the missionary overseas. Okay? So, anyway, I just thought that was interesting, you know? Stay in the house that you're at. And I think this is also a challenge for churches. You know, if a church has someone that they want to send out to be a missionary, I think that church, and, and you know they're going to a place where they can't work, maybe it's a foreign field or whatever, then I think that church should be doing everything they can to help that person achieve that goal. Okay? And again, you know, I know they mean well, but have you ever been to a church where they've literally got like a hundred missionaries on the wall? And they're like, look at all these, these hundred missionaries that we support. And they're like, you know, they send 50 bucks a week to this one, 20 bucks a week to that one, 100 bucks a week to that one. Like, you know, I mean, why? I mean, what if you just helped one missionary? What if that missionary knew, hey, this church, you know, the church that sent me, they're going to they're gonna provide for me. They're going to make sure that I have everything I need instead of, you know, having the 100, you know, missionaries for 50 bucks a month. It's not, I mean, you can pray for them. But I think what we see in the Bible is that, you know, the house of the Lord should be providing for the workers. Okay, that they have. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's go back to Luke 10. Luke 10, chapter 8. Luke 10, chapter 8. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you. Each such things are, um, as are set before you. So you can't be a fussy eater if you want to be a, a worker for the Lord, right? Whatever, whatever they serve before you, you've got to eat it, all right? There's, there's no vegans. There's no vegan missionaries, okay? <laughs> Verse number 9. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now, I just want you to, as we talk about the kingdom of God, um, I'm going to talk a lot about it in chapter 13 of Luke. But I just want you to pick up things as, as the kingdom of God is mentioned. We know that the preaching the kingdom of God is preaching the gospel. And we see that the kingdom of God, say to them, The kingdom of God is nigh unto you. What does that mean? It's near. It's close. Hey, you can, you can have it right now. I'm coming to show you how you can enter into that kingdom. And we ought to be a little bit like that. When we go and preach the gospel, you know, don't be shy. You know, don't be, um, what's the word? Timid, don't be timid. You've got the keys to the kingdom of God right there. It's close, it's near. That person at the door can be saved right now. Should they hear the word, believe it and call on the name of the Lord to be saved. All right, we ought to go with boldness. We have a... Uh, an amazing power, yeah, maybe not to cast out devils, but to open up that kingdom and allow people in through the preaching of the gospel. Hey, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, you know. We're coming in and bringing that kingdom very near, very close to these people at the door. It might be the closest they ever get to the kingdom, you know. <clears throat> Verse 10, But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out of the streets of the same, and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So even the ones that don't want to hear the gospel, they say, hey, tell them. You had the chance. You, you've had an opportunity to have the kingdom of God, uh, to receive the kingdom of God. You know? Don't be ashamed. Don't be timid. Verse number 12. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Say, Why? Because that city, those people had an opportunity to hear the gospel. Okay? They had a prophet coming through, you know, and, 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 and bringing that kingdom close to them. And so while we know the sins of Sodom, and we know, you know, the hellfire these people are suffering right now, you know, it's going to be worse for those that have the opportunity to receive the gospel. It's those that have every opportunity today and they reject it, it's going to be worse for them. You know, these people were casting out devils, doing amazing works of God. You know, they were able to see, you know, essentially, you know, the, the great works of God, and, and they still reject it. They reject these people. Hellfire is going to be worse for them. Okay? Hellfire is going to be worse for them. And we, we see that this is definitely about hell. Look at verse 13. Uh, Woe unto thee, um, Chorazin. So these are all cities. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, if you remember, go to Luke chapter 6. Go to Luke chapter 6. Go to Luke chapter 6, verse 17. So Jesus is saying, look, to these cities, and I'm, I'm assuming they're Jewish cities. Bethsaida definitely is. 
Um, Corazon, I'm, I'm not that sure, but I, I assume it is. It's saying, look, if, if these works were done in, a Gentile, in the Gentile cities, in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. Okay, they would have, you know, um, repented in sackcloth and ashes. Look at, look at Luke 6, verse 17. Luke 6, 17, you might remember this. It says, And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to, to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So, you know, Jesus is not talking nonsense. He's not making empty threats. You know, we see that there are people in these Gentile cities wanting to come and hear Jesus Christ, wanting to come and hear the gospel and be healed and see the mighty works of God. You know, had he gone into the entire city, wow, there would have been a, a, a great revival there, okay? But we definitely see what Jesus says to these cities, they're facts. They're fa he knows very well the kinds of people that would receive him. And in many cases, in this case, it was, it was the Gentiles instead of the Jews, all right? Go back to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 14. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So those are those cities that um, obviously did not believe on Christ, but they have, did not have the opportunity of Christ passing through those cities themselves. It's going to be more tolerable in the day of judgment than for you. We'll see this. Look at verse 15. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. So I assume Capernaum was probably filled with a lot of prideful people, thinking that they're close to God, thinking that they're on their way to heaven, and Jesus says you'll be thrust down to hell. I assume then they probably obviously re rejected uh, Jesus Christ. They rejected these 70 and the 12 that were going out there, and notice that they'll be thrust down to hell. So when we understand this about the cities, we definitely see that this is the judgment of God. You know, and have you ever, have you ever had people say to you, and maybe, you know, you've come across and said, you know, some hard truths on the, of the Bible. And people have said to you, hold on, aren't Christians supposed to be tolerant? Doesn't Christianity, Christianity teach tolerance? Have you ever looked up the word tolerance in the Bible? This is the only place that it's found. Okay, this is the only place. Look at verse 12. But I said to you, it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Yeah, I do believe in tolerance. Okay, and some people in hell, it's going to be more tolerable for them then for others, I believe in tolerance, yeah, okay? But tolerance of sin, no, I, I don't believe in tolerance for sin. I don't believe in tolerance for false religions. I don't believe in tolerance for false Jesuses and false gospels, no. But tolerance is taught in the Bible. And it's basically dependent on how much you're going to suffer in hellfire, okay? And so this is one major uh, uh, passage in the Bible that actually teaches us that for some, like hell's not, not equally painful for everybody, but for some, it's going to be much worse than for others, okay? Especially for those that had every opportunity to receive Christ, you know, and they've rejected Him. Uh, verse number 16. Verse number 16. So, I, yeah, I do believe in tolerance. Verse number 16. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. I love this verse. Because it keeps us, as soul winners, it keeps us humble. And it keeps us from getting discouraged as well. All right? So when we go out, you know, and, and we preach the gospel and people believe it and get saved, etc., etc., you know, this is going to stop you from getting too prideful and thinking, man, look at me. I'm so great. I'm, I'm the greatest soul winner on the planet. No. They, they heard you because they heard Jesus. Okay? It was because of Jesus Christ. It was because of the words of God that they got saved. It was through the power of the gospel is the power of the word of God that got them saved. You know, not your, uh, not your good looks, you know, <laughs> not your muscles that got them saved. It was all through the power of God that comes from his word. So that'll keep you humble. But also, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me. So if someone says, hey, you know, and you know they hate you, they don't want you there, maybe they, they swear at you or whatever, you know, you might take that personally, but Jesus says, hey, it's not you. They hate me. You know, they despise me. So that's going to help you from getting discouraged, right? So when people, when people have a go at you, you'll be like, you know what? It wasn't me. They actually hate Jesus, all right? And then he says, and he that despises me, despises him that sent me. That means they, they actually despise God the Father, ultimately, okay? Because they despise the Son. I mean, what does that say about Judaism? 
you know. I, I hear Christians say, well, they reject the Son, but they worship the Father. They, they love the Father. They want to serve the Father. No. If they despise Jesus, and they do, then they actually despise God the Father. Okay? So, you know, never, you know, Judaism is a false religion, guys. It's not Christianity, Old Testament. No. All right? It's a false religion. Um, just as much Islam is a false religion, just as much Buddhism and Hinduism is a false religion, you know, anyone that rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as a Savior, also despises God the Father. All right? Verse number 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Fantastic. We saw, same thing happened in the 12, if you remember, in the previous chapter. Now, let me just say a couple of things about these 70. This is the only time in the Bible that we read about them. Um, but they were given the same powers, they were given the same instructions as the 12 apostles, you know. And I don't think there's anything wrong with considering these 70 as apostles. They may very well have been apostles. But sometimes uh, we have this mindset that there were only 12 apostles. I mean, a lot of people think there were just 12 apostles. But we'll see in the Bible that there are, there are more than 12. And so I, I think you could call these 70 apostles, even though the Bible itself does not um, you know, um, name them by that name. But let's look quick, do a quick Bible study here. Um, so turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 26. Acts chapter 1, verse 26. I just want to show you this just for your, just for your knowledge. Acts chapter 1, verse 26. And remember, one of the apostles was the betrayer. One of the apostles was not even saved. And that was Judas Iscariot, remember? And he, he hung himself, he died, and then there were 11 left. Well, in Acts chapter 1, the 12 apostles, or the 11 apostles that, that remain, they wanted to fill that role. They wanted to fill that, um, that office. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Okay, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So we see Matthias, at least as far as the, the, uh, the, the 11 are concerned, Matthias took on the apostleship that was left by uh, Judas Iscariot. So we see Matthias is an apostle. Okay? Now look at Acts 14. Go to Acts 14, verse 14. Acts 14, verse 14. Because we have other apostles besides the 12. Acts 14, 14. It says, <clears throat> which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. Now we, we know Paul is an apostle, right? Yeah, he's written so much of the New Testament. He's a, he's a great apostle. But notice it says apostles, Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas was obviously Paul's helper. Uh, Barnabas and Paul heard of, and they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. So we see another two apostles there by name, Barnabas and Paul. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter four verse six. First Corinthians chapter four verse six. Notice this. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So there we see Paul mentioning Apollos. Now drop down to verse number nine. Verse number nine. He says. For I think that God hath sent forth us, the apostles, last, as they were appointed to death. So when he says the us there in verse number 9, he's referring to himself and, Ap and Apollos. Okay? And so there he's essentially calling Apollos an apostle as well. All right? Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1. Verse 19. So this teaching is not going to change your life. Okay? I'm just giving you information so when you read your Bible, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Okay? Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. It says, uh, But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So of the other apostles, I didn't see any except James. So what is this saying about James? That he's an apostle. He's an apostle that he saw. Now we know that... Of the 12, there was, there was also James there as well in the 12. But this James is actually a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
a son of Joseph and Mary. And we see here Paul calls James an apostle. All right. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. So this is, you know, obviously we know it's, a, it's an epistle of Paul. And it says here, <clears throat> Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Okay, so he, he's calling himself and those that are writing this letter, the apostles of Christ. Now go to chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So who wrote, uh, or, or who's, who, yeah, who's, who's, who's written 1 Thessalonians? Where's that coming from? It's definitely coming from Paul, we know that, but also from Silvanus and Timotheus. And then you remember in chapter 2, who refers themselves as the apostles, plural, of Christ. So here we definitely have Silvanus and Timotheus, who's also Timothy in the Bible, as apostles, recognized as apostles. And one more, turn to the book of Hebrews. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. All right. So there we have Christ Jesus, capital A apostle. All right. Capital A apostle and high priest. So just a little Bible study there. So I just wanted to show you that, you know, it's not just the 12 that were apostles. But that, um, you know, Jesus Christ had appointed other men to be apostles as well throughout his ministry. Remember, his ministry was three years long, okay? And then there were also certain criteria of somebody that could call themselves an apostle or take on that office of an apostle. I won't go into all of that today, but I just want to show you it's more than 12, okay? So if you ever have, you know, you ever playing Bible trivia and that question comes up, you know there's more than 12. I, I showed you these ones because we know them by names, there might be other apostles, but they're not known by names. That might be other men as well that we see in the scriptures. But anyway, I hope that was interesting. Go back to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Now, this is a, a very interesting uh, verse, okay? Luke chapter 10, verse 18. So remember, these 70 had just finished saying, hey, you know, we're casting out these devils. You know, even, even the spirits, you know, were under our authority in your name. And then we get to verse 18. And, and Jesus says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. All right? I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. It's an interesting, interesting thing. And I think this has to do with the kingdom of God, which I'm going to teach on you guys in, in chapter 13. But quickly turn to Revelation chapter 12. Turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. So we're turning to the book of Revelation uh, during the tribulation, or actually leading up to the great tribulation period in the Bible. And it says there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So some people associate Luke 10, 18 with Jesus beholding Satan falling from heaven with Revelation chapter 12. Even though Revelation chapter 12 is in the future, has not yet happened, they associate Jesus being the eternal God, seeing this as a future thing of heaven. Though that's not my interpretation. I just wanted to show you that. That's not my interpretation. I actually believe that, Je that Jesus did see Satan fall from heaven when, when these devils were being cast out out of these people. Okay, when the devils, when the, when the spirits were being cast out of people that were demon-possessed or de devil-possessed, he saw Satan fall out of heaven. But something that you may have noticed there in, in Revelation 12, it said um, about Satan, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So we know in Revelation 12 when Satan is cast out of heaven, that's it. 
that he'll never have a place anymore. He will never, ever uh, walk into heaven ever again. But that doesn't mean that he hasn't been cast out of heaven before. I mean, it kind of makes sense that Satan would come you know, and, and God would just be like, you know, get out of here, <laughs> and, he'd, and he'd fall out of heaven. But something that we notice about the kingdom of God, as we see the kingdom of God increase, you know, and we see the great works of God, one thing that you'll also notice in the Bible is we see the kingdom of Satan take a back step. It's not just that the kingdom of God grows, but the kingdom of Satan actually uh, also decreases as, as it grows, okay? There's this twofold thing. So I actually believe that as they were casting out devils, the kingdom of Satan was being shaken to the point that Satan himself was, you know, fell out of heaven as lightning. So I believe that was something Jesus had seen, especially when you look at, you continue reading, look at verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, you know, even, even uh, snakes and scorpions could not hurt these these 70 could not help hurt the 12 that went out preaching the gospel. And I believe this is also applicable to, you know, the power of the enemy, spiritual enemies. Okay, not just physical creatures that can hurt them, but also they had power over spiritual enemies. He says, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So if we keep verse 18 in context, you know, we see that, you know, Satan falling from heaven is associated with these devils being cast out, with these devils being under subjection of these apostles in Jesus' name. But Jesus says, look, even better than that, even better than these spirits being under your subjection, you know, at the verse 20, it says, uh, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What's even better than casting out devils is that you're saved, right? Right? And how many people, how many preachers, you know, boast about their power to cast out devils? You know, I don't, I don't believe they're casting out devils. But that's what they talk about. That's what they praise about. That's what they lift themselves up about. Jesus says, hey, it's better that you're saved. And a lot of people aren't, aren't even saved. Okay? In other words, you have greater reason to rejoice because you know your name is written in heaven than having these great powers that God gave you know, the 70 apostles. Let's keep reading verse number 21. And in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. You know, Jesus rejoices when, when the soul winners come back, you know, you know, talking about the great news that, that, that happened. He rejoices in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it, so it seemeth good in thy sight. All things are delivered, uh, delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So if you remember when I told on the Trinity last time, I mentioned that the Trinity is uh, specifically a New Testament doctrine. Not that it's not found in the Old Testament. It definitely is, Okay. But we see that it is a doctrine that became very clear, became very apparent by Jesus Christ. It's Jesus that really came preaching the Trinity, teaching about the Father, teaching of the Son. And, uh, you know, this is a great passage here because he says, look, you know, um, he, he mentions in verse 22 that no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father and who the Father is but the Son. No one knows who the Father is except the Son and he to whom the Son will reveal him. The only way to know God the Father is by Jesus Christ revealing that to you, okay? When you are saved through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ, then you have access to the Father. Then you can actually speak to the Father in prayer, okay? But we see that they're not one person, okay? There are two there, right? The Father, there's the Son. And notice that um, it said there in verse 22, All things are delivered to me of my Father. We see the teaching of the authority structure, the chain of command. It's the Father that's giving things to the Son. You know, Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Otherwise, he'd be giving things to himself. No, he says the Father delivers things to the Son. Okay? So the the Son reveals to us who the Father is. You're going to get the best teaching on the Trinity through the New Testament. And then when you revisit the Old Testament, you're going to be like, oh yeah, there it is. You're going to see the Trinity all over the Old Testament. But that's because you've been given the light 
that Jesus Christ gave us, teaching us about the, the relationship there of the Father and of the Son. Verse 23. And he, turned, and he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hey, you know, as a kid, I grew up in a church, and I knew I had to be in church, I knew it was the commands of God, but it was so boring, right? And, you know, and maybe that's part of my you know, problem with my, my own spirit, I was bored. But you know what, the preaching was boring, all right? I didn't learn anything new. I would rather, as a kid, I would rather just sit in church, read my Bible. I feel like I, I, I learned more just doing that than hearing the preaching, all right? But notice, we have a great privilege. Jesus says, look, there are many prophets of the Old Testament, there are kings, people of authority and power that wish to have the knowledge that you have. They wish to hear the preaching that we've heard, to know, you know, the things that we know, you know. And, you know, we should never be people that get bored in church. We should never get, be people that get bored of hearing the Word of God preach. Now, I understand if you get bored because many preachers don't even preach the Word of God. Or they, they, they read one verse and then it's all their own personal wisdom. Yeah, I can understand getting bored of that. Hey, but you know, thank God we're in a church. And look, I'm not boasting of myself because we've had other men preach and they open the Word of God and they teach us great things from the Word of God. Praise God. You know, this is something that we ought to rejoice in and value it. You know, value what we have because there are, there are other men, you know, prof, you know, better men than us, prophets of the Old Testament, that wish to have the information that we have. You know, please value the Word of God. Please read it. Please meditate. Please love it. Please you know, enjoy coming to church to just sit under the teaching of the Word of God. Verse number, what am I up to, guys? 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, are you going, when you go door knocking and you preach the gospel, are you going to turn to Matthew 10, 25 to teach on the gospel? So here it is. Here's the question. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why won't you turn there? <laughs> Look at verse 26. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. There it is, guys. That's how you get saved. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor. And uh, Jesus, yeah, you do this, and thou shalt live. That's how you get, yeah, you know, inherit eternal life eternal life. Is that how we're going to preach the gospel? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's look back at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Okay. He, this, this guy wasn't looking for a sincere answer. He wasn't someone that really wanted to know how to get to heaven. Okay. He came testing Jesus. He came tempting him. He wanted to trip up Jesus Christ. Okay. And look at verse number 29. But he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Hey, he wants to prove himself worthy of the kingdom of God. He wants to justify himself. No, you know, you, you, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can bring to God and be justified of. No, it's, it's salvation by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your own righteousness. Now look, it's, it's a pretty good answer. It's the kind of answer you get at the door all the time. You know, well, just love God, love your neighbors, do the best. No. No, that's how we get saved. No, well, part of it, there is a truth to that, right? Otherwise, Jesus would be lying. In verse 28, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. All right? So hypothetically, there is another way to heaven. There is another way to have the kingdom of God. That's basically, be perfect. Okay? Keep all the commands of God. Be perfect. Yeah, and thou shalt live. That's, that's one great way to go. To, I mean, but look, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. No, not one. Yeah, if you could do it all, you could keep it and be perfect like God, you'd go to heaven. Perfect. You don't even need to get saved because you're perfect already. <laughs> you're making your way through there. But hey, there is none righteous, no, not one. We should never be like this lawyer trying to justify ourselves. Someone asks you, hey, how do you know you're going to heaven? How, you know, why are you saved? Why are you so sure? You never justify yourself. Well, look at me. I go to church. 
you know, I do great works, I read my Bible. No, don't justify yourself. Just say, I'm a filthy sinner. I'm not righteous, but Jesus died for me. And I've placed my faith on him. Okay? Verse number 29. And he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus, and this is, this is a great parable. One of, the, one of the most famous parables that Jesus taught on. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this is a Jew, this is a Jewish man, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So this guy has been beaten, he's been stripped naked, he's half dead, he's going to die, should no one come to help him. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the priests that are meant to serve in the temple of God, they see this man, he sees this man, he just walks by on the other side. I'm not going to deal with that trouble, that's not my problem, I'm going to move on. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite. Now, the priests were meant to be Levites, but a Levite was, not all Levites were priests, but all Levites were re required to basically serve in the temple of God and be, you know, basically be of service to the nation of Israel. So this is another person that is supposed to be godly, someone that's supposed to know the Lord well and supposed to help their neighbors, supposed to serve other Jewish people, other Israelites. Verse 32, And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now stop there for a minute, because remember it's a lawyer, it's someone that, not, a lawyer is not like the lawyers we have today. Well, it's kind of similar, because a lawyer is like that we have today, is someone that knows the law. Okay, they're supposed to know the law, they're supposed to know how to represent people uh, through the law. And a lawyer back in these days was someone that knew the law of God. Someone that was well studied. Someone that, that uh, was a, maybe even a teacher. A teacher of the doctrines of the Bible. And so this is significant that Jesus Christ mentions the priest and the Levite because essentially they're all the same, uh, you know, very similar to what the lawyer is supposed to be. Okay? And he's saying, look, these righteous, these supposed to be righteous, godly people, they're not helping this man at all. But look at verse 33. And a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, uh, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. likewise. So what's Jesus saying? You're not loving your neighbor. Yeah, you gave the right answers. If you were able to love the Lord and you're able to love the neighbor and you're able to keep the commands of God, yeah, you would be righteous. You would have life. But Jesus, he says at the end of the parable, You've got to do likewise. In other words, you failed. You've broken the laws of God. You're not doing the things. You can't justify yourself, okay? And he uses, you know, these, these godly examples of the priest and the Levite because that's what the lawyer was supposed to be. You know, he's probably hang, hanging around the Levites and the lawyers. And he's saying, look, you guys, you're not being merciful to people. You know, but the Samaritan, the people that you hate, you know, the half-bred Jewish and the half, you know, Syrians or whatever it was, mix of people, you know, some of these people you know, are more merciful than you are, you know. Some of these people are closer to the Lord than what you are. And I also think that the, the Good Samaritan also represents Christ in many ways. You know, a lot of us just, you know, in sin, lost and dying, on our way to hell, literally half dead, right? You know, half dead, our spirit's dead. It's just the body needs to drop and, and then we're, we're on to hell. You know, and Jesus comes, takes him aboard, heals him and pays it all. He pays it He says, look, if there's anything left, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that gets paid too. All right, when Jesus Christ paid for our sins, he paid for it all. Our past, present, and future sins. All right, just like that Samaritan. Anything future that's going to cost, don't worry. I've taken care of that. I'll take care of that. All right? Verse 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, and he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So Mary and Martha, the two sisters, and, and they've got a famous brother as well in the Bible. You know, that is, that's Lazarus. The Lazarus that was raised from the dead by Jesus Christ. 
Well, these are siblings, Martha and Mary. They received Jesus into, his house, into their house. They, you know, they must be saved people. You know, we have Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ, listening, hearing the word of God. And then verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left to serve alone, left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Now look, Martha is kind. Right? I mean, look, she's serving. Jesus is here. You know, I'm, I'm going to make sure you know, he gets fed and you know, he has what he needs. You know, I'm, I'm going to be working around. You know, but then he, you know, she, she criticizes her sister Mary because she's not serving. You know, all Mary's doing is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the word of God. And look at verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. In other words, the reason you're reacting this way about your sister, Martha, isn't just because she's not helping you. You're actually um, careful, full of care, and troubled about many things. There's actually a lot of things in your life that is a bit out of control, and you're really troubled and worried about all those things, and it's coming out, and you're criticizing your sister Mary. Okay? And this happens in life. You know, it's happened to me. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Maybe you've had a stressful day at, on, at work. You know, there's a lot, a lot of problems, things on your mind. You know, sometimes you just want to come home and not, and not think about work, but you bring all the problems and stress with you. And then something small happens in the house and you react the wrong way. Okay, I mean, what happened wasn't worth how you reacted. This has happened to me. And it's because, you know, you're cumbered about with, with all the cares and all the worries that's on your mind and it causes you to react in, a, in, a, in the wrong way. That's essentially what Jesus is saying to, to Martha. Verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary have chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Hey, what's the good part that Mary did? What's the good work that Mary is doing right now? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and hearing the word of God. All right? Martha, she, she wants to be a help. No, she's not like an evil woman or anything like that, right? But she's so concerned about other things. She's distracted about other things. Instead of just sitting still and listening to Jesus, she's trying to, to work. And look, this is why when we have church service, we don't have any other ministries going on. There should be no other distractions going on. We just want to sit at the feet of the preacher and listen to the Word of God being preached. Okay? We're not ever going to have Sunday school during the church service. Okay? Because not only will you take the kids away, you're, you're, now, now, the, now there's a teacher being distracted. And they're not sitting. They're being cumbered about with worries and cares and stuff like that. Hey, that's not what we want. We don't want, Mar we don't want Marthas in this church. Yeah. Actually, I do want a lot of Marthas. I do want a lot of people serving. But when it comes to the preaching of God's word, it's time to sit down and not be distracted. You know, and as parents, we need to teach our kids to sit still. You know, to sit still, pay attention, listen to the word of God. And I know, like, you know, I've got little kids. I know, you know, they, they're going to get, you know, bored and, and maybe make noise and you're going to have to take care of that. And you're going to miss parts of, your ser parts of the sermon or whatever. But, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to make sure you don't miss too much. You know, Brother Matthew has put speakers into the mother's room. You know, please, if you need to go in there, please turn it on. If it's not on, put it up loud if you have to. I've been in church where literally mothers go into the mother's room and switch off the preaching so they can chat. Okay, no, that's not how, you know, that's, that's Martha. No, you know, it's time to be like Mary when we're in church service, okay? And if you miss the sermon, you can't make it on the day, hey, the preaching's on YouTube, the preaching's on audio. You know, go back and listen to the Word of God being preached, not because it makes me feel good. I, I don't, you know, I don't care if, if the, the numbers on YouTube go up by, by a number of views. I don't care. It's, it's for your sake. It's for our sake so we can sit, hear the Word of God. And, you know, as we go through chapter by chapter, sometimes I refer back to things we've already covered. So if you've missed things, you know, it's not, you're not going to get as much out of it um, in, in future sermons. But that's what I have for you guys today. You know, let's learn to sit still. Let's learn to take the Word of God seriously. Let's learn to love the Word of God and, uh, and take it in, and then once it's all over, then we can serve. Then we can be Martha and run around and, and serve one another. All right? Okay, let's pray.